Hi there, and welcome to The Daily Gardener, a podcast about gardening, botanical history, and literature. I'm your host, Jennifer E. Blaine, and today is October 12th. Today in botanical history, we celebrate a Dutch botanical illustrator, a writer from New Orleans, and a hymn writer who wrote over 400 hymns. We'll hear an excerpt from Terry Irwin, just fabulous. She's the wife of the late, great Steve Irwin. And we grow that garden library today with a book about living on the land, a hot topic since 2020. And then we'll wrap things up with a touching story about Beatrix Potter, who, by the way, was written about In a book by Marta McDowell, her book was called Beatrix Potter's Gardening Life, The Plants and Places That Inspired the Classic Children's Tales. Great book. You can get it on Amazon for under 10 bucks now. And then that's the perfect segue to tell you about her new book that just came out October 12th. It's called Unearthing the Secret Garden, The Plants and Places That Inspired Frances Hodgson Burnett. Of course, it's Frances Hodgson Burnett. But anyway, great book here. It looks like you can get used copies of this one for under 20, or you can get a brand new copy for $22.95 with free shipping on Prime. So go ahead and check that out. And if I get a chance to talk to Marta, what I'm going to ask her is how much of a tongue twister she finds it to have a title that starts with the word unearthing because I always find when I'm doing the segment on unearthed words that I have to be really careful with my enunciation. And I wonder if she is experiencing the same thing as she's talking about this book, Unearthing the Secret Garden. So just a little something that I'm curious about. Well, before we get into today's curated news, I had a few more tidbits that I wanted to share with you. Uh, One of them is that Today is the anniversary of a classic book from Martha Stewart. It was in 1991 that she released her book called Martha Stewart's Gardening Month by Month. And if you have not read this classic book, you should get yourself a copy. I just got myself another copy. I can't find the original copy that I had. And I have a nagging suspicion in the back of my mind that I loaned it to a friend. But in any case, I found that there are plenty of used copies available on Amazon. You can get them for around $3. And so that's what I did. I went ahead and ordered myself another copy. But it's a fun look back. Martha looks so different in this book. But the gardening advice, as with so much of what she does, is very well thought out very put together. The pictures are still inspiring. This book has a timeless quality to it. And I can't believe it's been 30 years since this book came out. So Martha Stewart's Gardening Month by Month. Today is the 30-year anniversary of that release. Just crazy. I can't believe it's been that long. All right. And then let's see here. Oh, here's a quote from Henry David Thoreau that I thought you would enjoy. This was something that he wrote about in his diary back in 1853. He wrote, how pleasant to walk over beds of these fresh, crisp, and rustling fallen leaves. And then he writes, how beautiful they go to their graves. Well, when I read that quote, it was making me think about taking Max on walks recently because we hit the ground running in the mornings after I dropped the boys off at school. And we usually go to a couple of different local parks. And one of the things I like to do right away is I try to go into the woods, find a walking stick. I've got a leash around my neck because he's wearing an e-collar. But just in case somebody stops me or gets upset that he's not on a traditional leash, I have that just in case. Although I don't need it. He's such a good dog. Uh, Let's see what else. I'm carrying a bag, obviously. So I've got that in my pocket. I've got my car keys. I've got my phone with me. Oh, and I have a ball launcher and a couple of tennis balls with me. So I'm carrying all of this. And of course, it's beautiful out. I mean, the leaves are changing colors in Minnesota. I know when I I shared a couple of pictures, Patricia Chandler Newport was commenting, oh my gosh, you're so much ahead of us in terms of the leaf color uh, compared to where she's at in Michigan. Here in Minnesota, I guess we're a couple of weeks ahead, maybe. I don't know. We'll see. But in any case, I've been taking pictures 
And what I have to laugh about is you should see me. So I'm walking the dog. I've got all this paraphernalia with me. I'm trying to hang on to all of it. And then I'm trying to take pictures. It's a challenge every day to try to capture the beauty, live in the moment, take some pictures, and at the same time, hang on to all the stuff that I need to walk the dog. Any of you have that experience as well? Well, if you do and you have a trick for me or you have some advice, let me know. I'm imagining that at some point down the road, I may end up wearing one of those vests where you've got like a thousand pockets and you can just put all the stuff in this vest. I I hope I don't end up doing that, but we'll see. Anyway, that's just my dilemma. But we've had a very productive weekend and early part of the week. We got the fire pit dug and does it look good? We got it all put together. We just barely had enough pea gravel. I would say to make it look perfect, we need another 10 to 15 bags of pea gravel. But of course, all of that has been shut down now at Home Depot. They're not selling mulch. They're not selling pea gravel. So we're going to have to wait till spring and just cross our fingers that we can get some extra before the grad party in May or June, depending on when we have it. But I tell you what, it feels so good to have that done. And then, of course, once the fire pit was done, then I wanted to move the firewood that had gotten stacked. I had a gentleman that I found on Facebook Marketplace bring the firewood to the cabin. And when he started to stack it up, he put it right next to some trees and shrubs and it was touching the trees and shrubs. So that was driving me crazy because I don't like to have my firewood stacked up against living plants or trees. And so I have this area that's right outside of the boulder edging where I wanted the firewood stacked. And so I was out stacking that firewood. And the day before, I had just given Max a very long shower because he'd gotten dirty. He jumped in the lake and it's very muddy right now. And we were trying to keep an eye on him. And my bad, I should have had him on the leash, but I didn't. And of course, what did he do? He jumped in the lake. And then When I opened the door to get him into the shower, I thought he would do what he did the previous day, which was just waltz right into the shower like a good dog. And this time he got away from me and he ran all around the basement with his extremely dirty paws. And then he ran upstairs and went into the family room and jumped on the sofa. I'm not kidding. So another shower. And then now 24 hours for that mud and dirt to dry on the floors and on the carpeting. And then later this week, I'll be going back up to the cabin and doing a deep clean with my Bissell cleaner. And I'm sharing that with you because if you're a gardener, we've all had days where you're outside in the garden and you're working so hard and you just have no energy left. And then you come back inside and something happens and you're just like, oh my gosh, it's just overwhelming. And it's because you're so physically tired from being out in the garden. So that happens to all of us. So I tell you what, a good 20 minutes later, after giving him a shower, I, I kind of stayed away from him and I just needed to not be around the dog for a little bit. And then we were good again. But it was too much, you know, after being outside all day, moving rock, which is really hard work, and moving firewood. Although I have to say, I really enjoy the challenge of stacking firewood. I find it very relaxing. But it is a lot of work, as with anything outside. But, you know, that's just how it goes sometimes. You get out of gas, and then you still need to come up with some reserves so that you can get through the rest of your day. But all of that said, I have to say that being outside this weekend was truly wonderful because we have had such really wonderful weather. The trees are changing. The geese are having a conference out on the lake, the geese and the ducks. In fact, just the other day, my son asked me, he goes, what are they talking about? And I said, they're talking about our new fire pit. (laughs) So Yeah, the geese are having all kinds of conversations right now. It's their busy time of year, and I really love watching all of the flocks land and take off out of our lake. That is a very special part about gardening up north. 
Oh, and I have this little October saying, this little piece of October folklore, and it has to do with the saying that you might have heard that's called the harvest of the geese or the geese harvest. And apparently that term came about because once the harvest was finished, then the geese would come in and they would finish up whatever was left. And that was called the harvest of the geese. So if you've heard of that term and kind of wondered about the etymology of that, that's what that is from. All right, it's time for today's curated news. All right, today's curated news comes to us from Garden Design. This is a post that was written by Mike McCaskey, and it's on top trees for fall color. This is something that's on everybody's mind right now. And even though we talk about this out of season, in spring, in winter, in summer, it just really doesn't resonate the way that it does when we talk about it right now. So I wanted to share this post with you today. I'm going to go over some of Mike's suggestions. I'm also going to share this in the Facebook group so you can check through all of this in detail. Mike does a great job. The photos are all there. The descriptions are there. You know the growing zones. And of course, since it's garden design, they do a great job of trying to pull together species That'll grow all over the United States, or at least try to cover all of the different areas with a few different options. So this is a great little post. Uh, let's see here. I'm going to do some call outs. They include the vine maple, beautiful red leaf, the Washington hawthorn, gorgeous red berries this time of year. I mean, we always focus on the leaf color, but this berry, oh my gosh this Washington Hawthorne. This is actually one that I want to incorporate on the edge of my woods up at the cabin. So I was really glad to see this here. The apple service berry, of course, the red berry on that. The red oak, which of course is beautiful. And then you've got the acorns for wildlife. So if you're trying to garden for wildlife, that's a good thing. Uh, let's see here, quaking aspen. That can be grown in zones one to six. It grows very, very tall, up to 50 feet. And the leaves on this are beautiful. They're golden, they're yellow, they're red, they shimmer. You get a lot of movement, thus the name Quaking Aspen. So that definitely belongs on the list. All of the maples, uh, sugar maple is on here. Uh, you know, I was just on Twitter and I was reading something that a botanist had posted recently about the sugar maples. And he was saying that the sugar content means that these trees are typically the first to turn. So if you're trying to come up with some hacks around tree identification, maybe if you're talking to the kids and they're wondering about trees turning color, you can point out the red sugar maples and talk about the color and the fact that they turn so quickly because of the high sugar content. That's pretty fascinating. Okay, uh, let me do a yellow one here. Okay, uh, bitternut hickory, that's on here. That's beautiful yellow. Oh, and then he ends with American persimmon. Now, again, this is not his complete list. I'm just giving you some call outs here. And of course, this article ends with some qualifiers because not every fall is the same. There is a Facebook group called Minnesota Naturalists. And they shared a landscape photo of some trees last year on, at this time versus this year at this time. And the difference in color was night and day. Last year, we had a lot more reds and oranges. This year, right now at this time, because it's been warmer, we're still seeing lots of yellows and greens. And what a difference a year can make. So the temperature is going to make a difference. The weather is going to make a difference. How many times have we had the most glorious promise of a beautiful fall only to have it dashed to smithereens because of a fall storm? That happens quite a bit. So it often seems like those really pretty falls, we get to enjoy them about once or twice in a decade because there's a lot that can go wrong to pull those leaves down at their peak or before their peak. And that's just the way it goes. 
Now, if you'd like to check out Mike's post from Garden Design, his top trees for fall color, all you need to do is search for one of those keywords in the Facebook group for the show and Mike's post will pop up. So type in the word fall or tree or color and you're going to get Mike's post. Now, the other thing I'm going to put in the Facebook group is something else that Garden Design sent me, and I thought this was fantastic, and it's their fall foliage prediction map. So if you're in an area and you're wondering, when is peak going to be around me or up north or down south or wherever you happen to be going, well, you can use this map from Garden Design and then you can plan accordingly. So I'll put both of them in the Facebook group for the show. You'll have Mike's trees for fall color and the fall foliage prediction map. They'll both be in the Facebook group. Hey, if you're not in the Facebook group, please feel free to come and join us. This is not a group for spam or advertising. I don't do anything with the names of the people that are joining the group. I don't even keep track of that. This is just really a resource for you as a listener of the podcast. I'm trying to make it easy for you to track down things that I'm talking about on the show and also hopefully enjoy a little camaraderie among gardeners. So that's all there is to the Facebook group. If you'd like to join the group, all you need to do is head on up to the search bar where you'd look for an old friend and instead look for your new group. See what I did there? And so you're going to type in the words Daily Gardener Community and then request to join. You'll answer three quick questions about the podcast. There's also a little space and you can write me anything. I'm the only person that reads your answers to these questions. So you can send me a little note that way. It's a quick and easy way to contact me. And then I'll admit you into the group. And in case you're wondering, the only reason why I ask those questions is, one, I'm very interested in learning your answers, and two, it helps me make sure that you're not a spammer, that you're a real person, a real gardener who happens to listen to The Daily Gardener. All right, it's time for today's botanical history. Here's botanical history for today, October 12th. Today we wish a happy heavenly birthday to the Dutch botanical artist Berta Hola van Nota, who was born on this day, October 12th in 1817. Berta's story is incredibly moving. She was born in Utrecht in the Netherlands. And she married a judge named Dirk, who secured a position in the Dutch colony of Suriname in South America. Now, the couple, Berta and Dirk, frequently traveled between Jakarta and Suriname. And along the way, Berta started collecting plants, and she drew those plant specimens. And then she would send the plants and her drawings back home to the botanical gardens in the Netherlands. Now, by the mid-1840s, Berta and Dirk made a major move to New Orleans, and it was there that they established a Protestant school for girls on behalf of the Episcopal Church. But in the summer of 1847, New Orleans was ravaged by an epidemic of yellow fever. It wiped out 10% of the population. After the yellow fever claimed Dirk's life, Berta, at the age of 30, was left to fend for herself and her five children. Berta attempted to open another school, this time in Galveston, Texas, but She was unable to pay her creditors, and she was forced to flee. Eventually, Berta joined her brother on a trip to Java. There she opened another school, but she also had a patron this time in Sophie Matilda, the wife of William II, the Dutch king. Now, since she had a patron, Berta could focus on her botanical work, which brought her tremendous happiness. 
and the result was her masterpiece, a collection of 40 plates of her botanical art. It was called The Selected Flowers, Fruits, and Foliage from the Island of Java. And this work was completed and published between 1863 and 1864. And if you've ever seen Berta's work, you'll notice it's dramatic, featuring rich colors and bold illustrations of magnificent plants that most Europeans had never seen. Now, in the introduction to her book on the tropical plants of Java, it's very apparent that Berta was aware of her station in life as both a woman and a penniless widow during the Victorian age. Berta basically apologized for her daring attempt at creating such a work, and she wrote these incredible words by way of explanation, and they also serve as a little mini biography of what she had been through as a wife, mother, and woman of her time. And so here's how Berta tells her story in the beginning of her beautiful book on the plants of Java. You may not, like myself, have tasted the bitterness of exile. You may not, like myself, have experienced, even in the springtime of life, the sorrowful separation from home and country, the absence of the friendly greeting on a foreign shore. Death may not have snatched away from you the arm which was your sole support. Bereavement may not have entered your dwelling like mine, as with one sudden stroke to tear away the veil of sweet illusions which as yet had hidden from your eyes the stern realities of life to place you with a lacerated heart, a shrinking spirit, and a feeble and suffering body before an unpitying necessity which presents no other alternative than labor. Well, it's clear from reading that that Berta was aware that she would have to work to take care of herself until the end of her days. And sadly, it seems she wasn't very successful. In 1892, Berta died impoverished on the island of Jakarta. She was 77. Well, now on to a happier story. Today is the birthday of George Washington Cable, the American writer and critic. He was born on this day, October 12th, in 1844. George was a son of New Orleans, and he's been called the first modern Southern writer. Despite being a German Protestant, instead of a French Catholic, George understood Creole culture, and he's most remembered for his early fiction about his hometown, including Old Creole Days, which was written in 1879, The Grand Decime, which was written in 1880, and Madame Delphine, which was written in 1881. Today, the George Washington Cable House is open to visitors. The house was declared a National Historic Landmark back in 1962, and it's located at 1313 8th Street in the Garden District of New Orleans. And it's worth noting that the house features gardens that were designed by George. In fact, the entire neighborhood is known for two things, outstanding restaurants and beautiful gardens. George was often inspired by the beauty of New Orleans when he wrote, and he was especially fond of nature and gardens. And so I selected some excerpts from his books that I thought you would enjoy. In The Taxidermist, his story begins this way. One day, a hummingbird got caught in a cobweb in our greenhouse. 
It had no real need to seek that damp, artificial heat. We were in the very heat of that Creole summertime, when bird notes are as many as sunbeams. The flowers were in such multitude that they seemed to follow one about, offering their honeys and perfumes and begging to be gathered. Our little boy saw the embodied joy fall, the joy no longer, seized it, and clasping it too tightly, brought it to me dead. He cried so over the loss that I promised to have the body stuffed. This is how I came to know Manvrier, the taxidermist in St. Peter Street. Next is an excerpt from George's essay called My Own Acre. A garden, we say, should never compel us to go back the way we came. But in truth, a garden should never compel us to do anything. Its don'ts should be laid solely on itself. Private grounds, no crossing. Take that away, please, wherever you can, and plant your margins so that there can be no crossing. Wire nettings hidden by shrubberies from all but the shameless trespasser you will find far more effective, more promotive to beauty, and more courteous. Don't make your garden a garden of don'ts, for no garden is quite a garden until it is a joyous garden. And then finally, in his essay called The American Garden, George wrote this. One of the happiest things about gardening is that when it is bad, you can always make it good. It is very easy to think of the plants, beds, and paths of a garden as things which must stay where they are. But it is short-sighted, and it is fatal to effective gardening. We should look upon the arrangement of things in our garden very much as a housekeeper looks on the arrangement of the furniture in her house. You will make whatever rearrangement may seem good to you. So there you go. Rearranging the garden, just like rearranging a room. And finally, today is the death of Cecil Francis Alexander, who died on this day, October 12th, back in 1895. She was an Anglo-Irish hymn writer and poet. Cecil wrote over 400 hymns. In addition to two of her very popular hymns, there is a green hill far away and the Christmas carol once in royal David City. Cecil wrote the beloved hymn called All Things Bright and Beautiful. Now, this hymn has many verses. And so what I decided to do was to pluck out the ones that refer to the garden or to nature. And then I share the refrain at the end. So. Here is an excerpt from All Things Bright and Beautiful by Cecil Francis Alexander. Each little flower that opens, each little bird that sings, he made their glowing colors, he made their tiny wings. The cold wind in the winter, the pleasant summer sun, the ripe fruits in the garden, he made them every one. The tall trees in the greenwood, the meadows for our play, the rushes by the water to gather every day. All things bright and beautiful, all creatures great and small, all things wise and wonderful, the Lord God made them all. It's time for today's Unearthed Words. Today's Unearthed Words come to us from Terry Irwin, 
the wife of the late, great Steve Irwin. This is an excerpt from her book, Steve and Me. The name of the zoo was the Queensland Reptile and Fauna Park. As I crossed the parking area, I prepared myself for disappointment. I'm going to see a collection of snakes, lizards, and miserable creatures in jars, feel terribly sorry for them, and leave. It was October 1991. I was Terry Rains, a 27-year-old Oregon girl in Australia on an unlikely quest to find homes for rescued American cougars. A reptile park wasn't going to be interested in a big cat. I headed through the pleasant spring heat toward the park, thinking pessimistic thoughts. This was going to be a big waste of time. But the prospect of seeing new species of wildlife drew me in. I walked through the modest entrance with some friends, only to be shocked at what I found on the other side. The most beautiful, immaculately kept gardens I had ever encountered. Peacocks strutted around, kangaroos and wallabies roamed freely, and palm trees lined all the walkways. It was like a little piece of Eden. It's time to grow that garden library with today's book, Carving Out a Living on the Land by Emmett Van Dreisch. This book came out in 2019, and the subtitle is Lessons in Resourcefulness and Craft from an Unusual Christmas Tree Farm. Well, I have to confess that I'm a huge fan of Emmett's YouTube channel. He does everything that he's talking about in this book, even carving his own spoons. But what I especially love about this book is learning about what it's like to be a Christmas tree farmer. I find this fascinating. And to me, this book is an excellent option for a Christmas gift. So keep that in mind as well. Now, what Emmett is writing about is simple living a life that's in tune with nature, a life that is away from the hustle and bustle of the city and the daily grind. Emmett is busy, but he has plenty of time to do the things that matter, even pursuing his favorite pastime of spoon carving. Now, I have to confess that I discovered a very pleasant surprise when I started reading Emmett's book, and that is that he's an excellent writer. And I wanted to give you a little taste for his writing, a little sample, just by reading what he wrote in the introduction to his book. He writes, The air is cold enough for my breath to show, but I'm about to break a sweat. I'm harvesting balsam branches, grabbing each with one hand and cutting them with the red clippers in the other. I work fast and don't stop until my arm is completely stacked with branches and sticking straight out, and I look like a kid with too many sweaters on under his jacket. Pivoting on my heel, I stride back to my central pile of balsam boughs and dump the armload on top, eyeballing it to gauge how much the pile weighs. I decide I need more and head off in another direction into the grove. The balsam fir grows from big wild stumps and thickets that can stretch 20 feet around. The trees crowded so closely together in no apparent order or pattern that their branches interlock. Instead of single trees, Each stump has up to three small trees of different ages growing off of it. They are pruned as Christmas trees, and I am a Christmas tree farmer. Isn't that fascinating? 
Well, this book is 288 pages of self-reliance and the Christmas spirit. You can get a copy of Carving Out a Living on the Land by Emmett Van Dreisch and support the show using the Amazon link in today's show notes for around $13. Finally, here's something sweet to revive the little botanic spark in your heart. It was on this day, October 12th in 1907, that a 41-year-old woman named Beatrix Potter wrote to Millie Warren, who was the sister of her publisher, friend, and former fiancé, Norman Warren. Norman had died two years earlier, just a month after his engagement to Beatrix at the age of 37. And as for Beatrix, she would wear Norman's ring on the ring finger of her right hand until the day that she died, three days before Christmas in 1943 at the age of 77. Now, when Beatrix wrote this letter back in 1907, she was all excited about gardening, and she couldn't wait to tell the woman who should have been her sister-in-law all about it. Here's what she wrote to Millie on this day in 1907. My news is all gardening at present and supplies. I went to see an old lady at Windermere and impudently took a large basket and trowel with me. She had the most untidy garden I ever saw. I got nice things in handfuls without any shame. Amongst others, a bundle of lavender slips and another bunch of violet suckers. Incidentally, 20 years earlier on this day, back in 1887, Beatrix drew her very first fungus. She was 21 years old, and she drew a very nice illustration of the Verdigris toadstool. Thanks for listening to The Daily Gardener. And remember, for a happy, healthy life, garden every day. The Daily Gardener is produced in lovely Maple Grove in Wyoming, Minnesota. If you want to read today's show notes, just head on over to thedailygardener.org. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for my free Friday newsletter. And don't forget that you have a standing invitation to join the free Facebook group for listeners of the show. Just search for Daily Gardener Community the next time you're on Facebook and request to join. Last but not least, you can always get in touch by emailing me at jennifer at thedailygardener.org. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling, and as always, have a great day in the garden, and we'll see you tomorrow.